18-year-old Irishman named William began studying physics and computer science at a university in Belfast, Northern Ireland. While he was certainly smart enough to complete the four-year degree, after one year of being in the school, he decided to drop out because he felt like this was not the path he wanted to be on. So he moved back home to a town about 30 minutes north of Belfast, where he got a job as a forklift driver and truck driver for the Guinness Beer Factory. And while he loved this job, he still felt like this was not the path for him. He needed to do something more with his life. And so he decided he would pursue what two of his siblings had gone on to do, which was to become a school teacher. He had always admired his school teachers growing up, and he idolized his two siblings that had become teachers, and so it felt like the right fit. And so William applied to a four-year teaching college in Newcastle in England, and after he was accepted, he flew to England, he got set up, and then he began his studies. The first year was great. He loved what he was doing, he did feel like this is the right fit, and he was getting good grades, everything was going exactly to plan. But then year two happened and everything went off the rails. A requirement to graduate from this four-year teaching college was all the aspiring teachers starting in their second year had to go teach real students real lessons. They basically had to go to high schools and elementary schools and fill in for the real teacher and give a real lesson. And they were scored on their ability to do that. But all the aspiring teachers knew that when you gave these real lessons to real students, what really ended up happening was the students did not take the aspiring teachers seriously. They viewed them as kind of like substitute teachers, and so they didn't respect them, and they didn't listen to them. And so typically, these real teaching sessions just turned into the aspiring teachers desperately trying to calm down their pupils long enough to get them to listen to their lesson plan for just one second but normally it didn't work out and before long the day was over and nothing was really accomplished. So in William's second year, when it was his turn to go over to a high school and administer his lesson plan, he went over there knowing what he was up against. He did not really expect it to go well but he decided he would go in there with a positive attitude and he would try to do his best. But as soon as he walked into his classroom, he immediately could tell he was gonna be overwhelmed. Everybody's standing up and talking amongst themselves and they turn around and they see William walking in and they have this moment of realization that their real teacher is not gonna be teaching them that day. It's gonna be this substitute, William, and they all kind of gleefully began laughing and joking and they just turned their backs on William and kept talking amongst themselves. And so William goes and Side, he puts his stuff on the desk and he attempts to get the class to listen to him by saying, hey everyone, come on, sit down, time to listen up, I'm your new teacher for the day, but the kids just were not listening. And so finally, William, who was a really big guy, he was six foot four, he was in great shape, he kind of postured himself and then yelled at the class, sit down right now. And at this, the class did turn around and looked at William and kind of sized him up and most of them decided, okay, it's time to sit down. And so 99% of the class goes quiet and sits down except for one kid. It was this 15 year old boy who was at the back of the room and he was standing up defiant with his arms crossed, staring at William with a smirk on his face. And all around him, all his cronies were sitting down looking up at him, laughing and kind of looking up at William and laughing at him, knowing that a confrontation was about to ensue. And so William is staring at this kid, trying to get him to just sit without saying anything. And this kid is just mean mugging him with his arms crossed and nothing's happening. And so William walks right up to him and kind of leans over his shoulder and says, you need to go out in the hallway right now. I will meet you out there. And then William turned around and started walking back towards the front of the room, expecting this to have worked, that this 15-year-old kid would have just followed right along and he'd walk right out to the hallway and that would be that. But when he turned back around again, the 15-year-old kid had not moved. He was still standing in the back of the classroom, arms crossed, staring up at William, basically saying, make me. And at this, William lost his mind. He was so mad and so frustrated at how unbelievably disrespectful this kid was being, and really the whole class was being to him, that he just kind of lost it. And he ran up to this kid in the back of the room and he gets right up in his face. And remember, William is six foot four. He's a big guy. And he gets right in the kid's face and he's like, get out in the hall right now. And this kid 
doesn't flinch. Instead, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a knife and he holds it right up against William. And William, without any hesitation, just winds up and blasts this kid across the side of the head, sending him flying over a kid sitting at a desk. He goes flying over this kid and crumples into the corner. And then when he stands up, he drops the knife and puts his hands up and he's like, okay, okay, I'll go out in the hall. And William's like, go, go out in the hall right now. And so the kid ran out of the classroom. He goes out into the hall and the whole class is totally silent. No one even wants to look up at William. They're all kind of just looking down at their desk, trying to be as quiet as possible. And William walks back to the front of the class and proceeds to teach the rest of the lesson. As soon as the high school learned that this aspiring teacher, William, had basically knocked out one of their students, even though it seemed like it might have been a little bit deserved, they immediately told the teacher's college and the teacher's college immediately expelled William. And so now William is suddenly jobless and he's kind of lost again in the world. He doesn't know what he wants to do now because he really had committed to being a teacher. And so he goes back to his home in Northern Ireland and he begins thinking about, you know, what is he going to do next? And he keeps having this thought that he should pursue this thing that he's always been interested in, but he had never taken seriously because it felt so risky. But now that basically everything in his life had fallen apart, he had nothing to lose. So he decided, what the heck, I will do the thing that I've always wanted to do and that was stage acting. And so he went and auditioned with a local theater company in Belfast. He was accepted into the theater troupe. And then four years later, he was discovered performing on stage by a Hollywood filmmaker. And they cast him in a movie and the rest, as they say, is history. William Neeson, better known as Liam Neeson, would go on to star in dozens of huge movies and TV shows. And he's probably best known for his epic role in the movie Taken, where he is the CIA operative with a particular Set of skills and in this movie he punches a lot of people in the face just like when he was a teacher. In 1963, when Tim Dick was just 10 years old, he went over to his friend's house and he snuck a bottle of whiskey from one of their shelves. He pulled it out and he poured himself a full glass to the brim with whiskey and then he downed it in one huge gulp. Tim had grown up idolizing cowboys on TV and every time he watched them, they would come galloping into some town, they would go into the saloon and they would sit at the bar just throwing back shots of whiskey. And so Tim always assumed whiskey must be this totally amazing, refreshing drink for these guys to be drinking it out in the heat of the desert. But unfortunately for Tim, after he slugged this huge glass of whiskey, it was not refreshing. It tasted like gasoline and his chest felt like it was on fire. But instead of being turned off by alcohol and waiting until he was older and of age to try it again, Tim instead thought, you know what? The next time I have whiskey, I just need to water it down a little bit. And so for the next year, Tim continued to periodically sneak whiskey out of his friend's cabinets and he would drink this watered down whiskey. And then when he turned 11 years old, his father, who he was very close with, died tragically in a car accident. And Tim really didn't have a good way to cope with the grief of losing his father. And so he turned to drinking even more than he already was. And before long, Tim was like this young kid who basically was an alcoholic but he hit it extremely well. He graduated high school, he graduated college, and really nobody knew he was drinking as much as he was. But after he graduated college and he was living on his own in Michigan, there was no structure in place or person in place to stop Tim from going overboard with his substance abuse. And so not only did his drinking get completely out of control, but he began using and selling drugs, namely cocaine. In 1978, when Tim was 25 years old, he and his drug dealer partner were scheduled to take part in the biggest drug deal of their careers. They would be selling about a pound and a half of cocaine to a guy named Michael Pfeiffer, and he'd be buying it for $42,000, which when you adjust that for inflation would be like buying it for $175,000 in 2021. Tim and his partner were very excited about all this money they were going to make, but they were equally worried about the transaction. A lot can go wrong. And so Tim decided in order to mitigate their nerves and kind of make this a safer drug deal, he decided they would do the transaction inside of a public airport because Tim had seen that done on TV and believed that would give them an additional layer of safety. And so on the day this deal is going to take place, Tim takes the pound and a half of cocaine, he puts it inside of a brown Adidas gym bag, and he also throws a key lock inside of this bag. He zips it up, he walks outside, he dumps the bag in the back of his car, and he drives to the Kalamazoo International Airport in Michigan. 
When he gets there, he parks in the big parking lot right outside of the front doors. And as soon as he's parked, he goes around to the back of his car. He pulls out this brown Adidas bag. He throws it over his shoulder, shuts his trunk, and then he waits for his partner to show up. A couple of minutes later, right on time, his partner pulls into the lot, he parks nearby, and then the two of them very casually begin walking towards the front doors of this airport. They walk up the steps, they go in the front doors, and as soon as they're inside, they're looking around and they find Michael Pfeiffer. He's standing up against the wall right in the area he had said he would be. And so without making any sort of contact with Michael, Tim and his partner turn the corner and they go into a nearby locker room. Once they're inside, Tim pulls the lock out of the brown bag and then he puts the bag with the drugs in it inside of a locker. He shuts it and then uses the lock he had just pulled out to lock the locker. And then he and his partner leave the locker room. As soon as they go out into the main terminal, they start walking over towards Michael Pfeiffer. And as they get closer and closer, Tim's partner breaks off and goes to a bench on the other side of the terminal. And Tim continues walking on right up to Michael. And then when he reaches Michael, he very discreetly hands him the key to the lock on the locker. And he tells him which locker number the drugs are in. Michael doesn't say anything. He takes the key and he heads off to the locker room. Tim turns and he goes over to his partner and he sits down on the bench and waits. Meanwhile, Michael goes inside the locker room. He uses the key. He opens up the lock. He opens the locker up. He checks to make sure the drugs are still there. They are. As soon as that's confirmed, he takes the bag. He throws it over his shoulder and he walks back out to the main terminal to meet up with Tim and his partner. Tim and his partner are sitting on the bench. They see Michael coming out of the locker room and they're expecting Michael to walk over and basically hand them a bag full of $42,000. But instead, Michael walks up to them and draws a gun and points it at them and says, I'm a police officer. You're under arrest. It would turn out this was a sting operation. Michael Pfeiffer, the undercover police officer, had been following around Tim and his partner for months. In Michigan at the time, if you were caught trying to sell 650 grams or more of cocaine, there was an automatic penalty of a life sentence. And Tim and his partner had just been arrested trying to sell more than 650 grams of cocaine. And so facing a life sentence, Tim took a deal that gave him a lesser sentence in exchange for information about other drug dealers. And so Tim would ultimately serve two years and four months in a federal penitentiary before he was released. Tim would say his time in prison was absolutely miserable, but it was necessary. It matured him in a major way and it honed his sense of humor. Tim was always a very funny guy. He was always the class clown and the guy goofing around. But in prison, he found it a very difficult task to get these hardened prisoners and prison guards to laugh at his jokes. But eventually, with enough practice and repetition, he could get anybody in that prison to laugh at him. And so by the time he got out, he was like an amazing comedian. And so he decided, you know what? Why don't I pursue a career in comedy? Four years later, Tim Dick, better known as as Tim Allen landed the starring role on the hit TV show Home Improvement. And from there, he starred in dozens more movies and TV shows, but he's probably best known for his voice acting in the very popular movie series Toy Story, where he plays Buzz Lightyear. Today, Tim is sober and has been for decades. In 1964, during his final semester of college in Wisconsin, a 21-year-old man named Harry decided to take an acting class. He believed it would be an easy A, and he'd always been pretty shy, and so he figured this class might be able to help him get over that. But this class wound up having a much larger impact on Harry's life than he ever could have imagined. Not only did he meet his future wife in this class, but he also realized he loved acting, something he never thought he would like, and he decided after college that that was the thing he was going to pursue. And so after he graduates later that year, he and his girlfriend get married and then they fly out to Hollywood, California, where Harry auditions for Columbia Pictures New Talent Program, which is basically this program that's designed to help new actors and actresses get parts in Hollywood because it's so hard to do that. And so he's accepted into this program. He signs a contract with them that pays him almost nothing. And right away, they start shopping him around for different parts in TV shows and movies, but no Nobody is interested in Harry. Nobody. The only roles he was getting were incredibly minor and usually non-speaking, and so it was really not advancing his career. Then, in 1966, so two years after he and his wife had arrived in Hollywood, Harry received what seemed like his first big break. He was offered a speaking role in a movie, although it was a very minor role. It was a 60-second bit where Harry basically walked on screen in this hotel, and he started calling out for a particular guest, and when he finds this guest, he walks up and gives him a piece of paper 
paper, and then he leaves. So it's a forgettable scene, but it's a real scene in a real movie. And so this was a big deal for Harry. And so after Harry goes over to the studio and he films this whole scene and it's all done, he goes back over to the headquarters of the new talent program at Columbia Pictures. And as soon as he goes inside, one of the producers that was in charge of this new talent program, who had apparently had a chance already to see this 60 second scene in this movie that Harry was in, he calls Harry over and asks him to go up to his office for a second. And so the pair go up to his office, they both sit down and the guy looks at him and says, look, I just gotta shoot you straight here. You're not gonna make it in Hollywood. You're not gonna be a movie star. When Tony Curtis was told to carry groceries across this room in one of his first movies, everybody knew right away as he's carrying those groceries that that guy, he's going to be a movie star. You could see it in the scene, even though all he was doing was carrying groceries. And when you did your scene as the bellhop walking around the hotel, I just didn't see it. You don't have the X factor. You're not going to be a movie star. For reference, Tony Curtis, the guy this producer was referencing, was a huge movie star in the 1950s and 1960s. And so Harry, after getting this horrible comment made about him, he pauses for a second, and then he leans across the table and looks at this producer and squints his eyes and says, you know, if Tony was such a good actor, shouldn't we have believed he was just a grocery delivery boy, not a movie star? And at this totally smart aleck remark, the producer fired Harry on the spot. Harry would go on to sign a similar new talent program deal with Universal Studios, but again, he could not get a real part to save his life. And the feedback he finally got was, Harry, you're just not pretty enough and you're not really that talented. By the mid 1970s, Harry was in his mid thirties and while he still aspired to be an actor and wanted to be an actor, he was making almost no money from acting. And so he decided instead of acting, he was going to become a carpenter. That was going to be his full-time job. Despite the fact he knew nothing about carpentry. And so he literally, just because he has this interest in carpentry, goes to the library and checks out all these how to be a carpenter books. And over the next couple of weeks, he studies these books and does a couple projects around his own house. And then finally, he just felt confident enough or he was just desperate enough for money that he began going around to his network and asking people in Hollywood if they needed some woodworking, if they needed help from a carpenter. And surprisingly, lots of people took him up on his offer and they hired him to be their carpenter. And before long, Harry Harry was dubbed the Carpenter to the Stars, which was kind of ironic because he actually was not a very good carpenter and he was regularly seen on the job, literally holding a book, teaching him how to be a carpenter while doing the carpentry with his other hand. In 1976, Harry was a full-fledged carpenter and had been for about a year when one of his very close friends named Fred Roos, who was a casting director and film producer, gave him a call and told him he had a very unique opportunity for him. Now, at this point, Harry was not looking for any more acting roles. He kind of figured that that ship has sailed, even though he wishes he could be an actor. At this point, he had a wife, he had two sons, and so he's thinking, I gotta just keep doing this carpentry thing because I gotta pay the bills. So he says to Fred, Fred, you know, I appreciate the offer of whatever this is, but if it has to do with acting, you know, I'm, I'm just not interested. And Fred, who was one of the very few people in Hollywood who fundamentally believed Harry was destined to be a star, told Harry, no, 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 this is different. This is not a pure go out and try out for the part and hope for the best. This is like put yourself in a good position and maybe somebody will discover you're as talented as you really are. And so Harry's like, okay, Tell me about this opportunity, you know, I'm interested. And so Fred explained there was this really talented and eccentric film director who was trying to cast an upcoming movie. And the way he went about casting for movies was a little bit strange. Instead of having each of the actors and actresses show up and individually audition for their parts, he would group batches of actors and actresses and he would have them audition as a group because that way he could tell if there was chemistry amongst some of the actors and actresses and he could gauge their individual talent. And so he had all these groups already planned out, but one of the groups was missing one male actor. Somebody had dropped out at the last minute and was not gonna be there on the day of the audition. And so when Fred Roos heard through the grapevine that this director was gonna be short this one person, he immediately reached out to the director and said, hey, I got your guy. There's this guy, Harry. He's done a little bit of acting. He's incredibly talented. You gotta give him a chance. You know, at the minimum, he can come in there and he can at least just read the lines and help you do this audition but I know he's available that day and I know he would love to help and so this director tells Fred okay thank you I'd love to have him come down but stress to him he is not 
auditioning for any part in this movie. I'm not bringing in some person and just throwing them in. It takes me a long time to find people that I want to audition, and he is not one of them. He is just there to facilitate the audition. He's just going to read the lines so the other people in his group can do their audition. And so after Fred stopped explaining the situation, Harry was actually kind of annoyed. He was annoyed that Fred had basically already volunteered him, and so he couldn't really even say no without making Fred look bad. And he didn't like the idea that this was basically a waste of his time. He was being asked to go read lines, but not even try out. So how was this even an opportunity? But Fred told him, look, worst case scenario, you meet some pretty powerful people in Hollywood. This director's a big deal. The people there are gonna be big deals in Hollywood. So you'll meet them and maybe they will recognize your talent. Or maybe you get some new clients for your carpentry business. So no matter what, you get something out of it. And so finally, Harry says, okay, fine, I'll go do this thing. And so Harry goes to this audition, he's handed the script, and he's reminded repeatedly to not attempt to audition. Don't try to act, just read the lines. I don't care if you're monotone, you just read these lines because you're not auditioning. Everybody else is, you're not. Is that clear? And Harry's like, yes, I get it. I'm just reading the lines. And so Harry sits down and he starts reading the lines and he's trying to do what they told him to do, but the way he was actually feeling and his actual personality began seeping through. He started coming off as this really grumpy and sarcastic guy that just didn't care about anybody there. He was just totally bitter that he was in the situation he was in. And apparently this is exactly what the director was looking for in one of the characters he was trying to cast. That kind of nonchalant, bravado, macho, alpha type guy who just didn't care about anybody. And so over the course of the day, as he's reading the script over and over again, not caring at all about how he's performing. He's just simply reading these lines and just being himself, he was actually doing this amazing job portraying one of the characters. And so they let Harry go the whole day. No one told him they were looking at him as a potential character. And then at the end of the day, when Harry was about to just throw the script in the trash and leave without talking to anyone, the film director, better known as George Lucas, walks up to Harry, better known as Harrison Ford, and says, wait a minute, I was wrong. You are perfect for this movie, Star Wars. You need to play Han Solo. And so Harrison Ford said, all right, I'll play Han Solo. And that role as Han Solo propelled Harrison Ford into the megastar that we know him as today. A few years after Harrison had starred in Star Wars and he was this total A-list celebrity, he was at a Hollywood studio in one of their restaurants when one of the waiters walked over to him with the silver tray and on this silver tray was a single business card. So Harrison reaches over, he grabs the business card, the waiter walks away and he looks at the card and handwritten on it is the phrase, I missed my bet. And he flipped the card over and it was the name of that producer from the new talent program that had called Harry into his office and said, you're never going to make it in Hollywood and you're fired. It was that guy. And he had apparently sent the waiter over to make amends because he was eating lunch in the same restaurant. And so Harrison would later say in interviews that at the time he got this card and to this day that he was doing this interview, he said it gave him immense pleasure that when he looked up from this business card and he understood the situation, he knows this guy's in the room somewhere. As he looked around the room, he couldn't recognize the guy because he didn't know what he looked like. He was a nobody. And so instead of wasting any more time looking for this producer, he just looked at the card, chucked it, and went back to eating his lunch. So that's gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. In the US Army, a man retires and moves to Central Florida with his wife and young son. Although his family had plenty of money because he had a pension coming in and his wife still worked full time, he just got bored really quickly after moving to Central Florida and decided he would just take a job doing something just to stay occupied. And so he ended up taking a job at a highway gas station. One of the primary reasons he chose this particular job is because the owners of the gas station didn't care if his son came along to help him stock shelves and hang out behind the cash register. And so for years, that's just how it went. The man would work at the gas station and his son would tag along. Even after his son became a teenager and you'd think might be wanting to do other things, well, the town was so small, there was almost nothing to do. So his son still came along well into his teenage years. 
One night in 1990, his son, who was 15 years old at the time, was at the station and he was actually taking a break sitting outside on a picnic table. He was reading a magazine, drinking a Mountain Dew, and you know, it's dark out and he notices out of the corner of his eye that there is a woman walking off of the highway towards the gas station. It was a very quiet night at the time, so there's no cars getting gas, there's nobody there, and there's not really anybody even driving on the highway, and so that's why she really stood out to him. And he turns and he notices her and he thinks to himself, you know, no one ever walks to our gas station. We're on a highway, everybody drives here. So she must have broken down and she must be coming here to try to use our phone to call a tow truck or something like that. So the woman is walking across the lot, coming closer and closer to the gas station. And the boy at this point has turned his attention back to his magazine, but he would say later that he kept looking up and keeping an eye on her because there was something off about her. The woman ultimately walks right behind him and goes in the door into the gas station. Doesn't acknowledge the boy, doesn't say hi to him, just walks straight inside and she starts walking up and down the aisles of the gas station. Now from where the boy was sitting, it's all glass so he could clearly look in and see his father behind the counter and he could see the head of this woman as she walked in and around all these aisles. And as soon as the woman was in the store kind of pacing around the aisles, the boy put his magazine down and was just watching. And he noticed that she was not really shopping. She was just looking down for a few seconds, wouldn't pick anything up, so she wasn't buying anything. And she would look up at the counter where his father was and she would just stare at him and then she'd look back down at what she was doing and she would go through all the aisles. And at some point, the woman just kind of abandons this phony, I'm pretending to shop routine and just walks up to the counter. Now, nobody else is in the store. There's nobody else coming in. And so the boy could actually fairly clearly hear what she was saying to his father. And she told his father that she had broken down and she needed a ride and could he drive her to Ocala, which was the next big town north of this gas station. And the boy would say that his father acted very strangely because his father is normally incredibly pleasant with all the customers. He's very chatty even. Like he talks to everybody who comes in the store. But as soon as this woman had gone in, his dad had seemed kind of dismissive and almost rude to this woman. And when she was talking to him, asking for a ride, he just said, no, I won't give you a ride. The woman is annoyed by how quickly she's been shot down. But instead of just taking no for an answer, she turns and looks at the boy, the boy who's sitting out on the bench, who's looking right at her. And she points at the boy and she says, what about him? Is he your son? Can he give me a ride? The boy notices that his father, who's not within her eyesight, is looking at his son going, no. Like, whatever she wants from you, you're gonna say no to it. And the boy's a little bit confused by this because he's still trying to understand why his dad was so against helping this woman because she clearly needs our help or someone's help, but he just took his dad at face value. And when the woman's pointing at him, he knew the boy that if she came over and asked him, he would say no. But it wouldn't come to that because the boy's father would say to the woman, no, my son's not gonna give you a ride. You need to leave here immediately. Do not come back, leave, we're not gonna help you. She's furious, she's cussing him out. She storms out and slams the door. She starts cussing at the boy and she walks off the whole time. She's turning around and flipping them off and screaming profanities at them, but she ultimately walks off. And the dad kind of followed her out and is standing next to his son as she walks off. And the boy asks his dad, like, what, what was her deal? Why did that happen? Why did you, why did you not want to help her? And the dad just said, I don't know. There was just something, there was something off about her. And I, I don't know how to place it, but I did not want her around you. I, I knew I didn't want to give her a ride. I just, I knew she had to go. A year later, the boy is in his room when he hears his dad in the other room yelling for him to come in here and look at the TV. So he runs into the TV room and on the TV is the same woman from the gas station, better known as Eileen Warnos. She was a serial killer who used to pick up her male victims at gas stations in Florida. It's unclear whether the boy or the boy's father were her next victims. But by the time she had shown up at that gas station, she had already killed four people. And following that interaction with them at the gas station, she had gone on to kill three more people, including someone in Ocala, Florida, which was the town she had asked them to give her a ride to. Eileen had been caught, that's why she was on TV, and she was later sentenced to death. In the late 1970s, a medical student going to school in Chicago had just gotten out of class and decided he didn't want to pay for a taxi, so he decided he would hitchhike his way home. Now, this was something he routinely did and at the time was socially acceptable. So he goes down to the road and he puts his thumb out and eventually a car pulls up and he would describe the man that is pulling up as looking normal and even friendly and lighthearted. It's a middle-aged guy. 
and he tells the student, hey, come on in, hop inside, I'll give you a ride. The student did not feel threatened by this guy and felt like overall this was safe. And so he hops in the passenger seat. He tells this man where he wants to go. He says, okay, and they start driving off. So as they're driving, it's silent in the car. They're not making chit chat, they're just driving along. And the student notices that the man misses the turn to go where he needs to go. And so the student turns to the man and says, hey, you know, you missed, you missed the turn. Do you mind turning around and going back this way? Or, you know, if you want, you can just drop me off here and, and I'm happy to walk. We're not that far away. The man who had seemed really nice and lighthearted suddenly had this really intense demeanor come over him. And he turns and looks at the student and goes, oh no, you're coming with me. The student is frozen in fear. He doesn't know what to do, but he knows immediately that this is not an idle threat. I don't know who he is. I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be bad for me. I have to get out. And so as soon as the car began to slow down even a little bit, I mean, they're still driving, they're not stopped. The student unlocks the door, opens the car and jumps out of the moving car and smashes into the ground, rolls against the side of the curb, but is ultimately unhurt. I mean, he's banged up from jumping out of a moving car, but he was able to stand up and run back to his house. He didn't call the police because he really didn't know what to tell them because he didn't have a great description of the guy. He didn't have his license plate and the guy didn't do anything totally aggressive. It was more of a threat, but an ambiguous threat at best. It wasn't really clear what he wanted to do with him. It definitely did not seem good, but it just wasn't enough for him to call the police. And so the student just feels lucky that he got out of there and moves on with his life. A couple of years go by, the student at this point has basically forgotten about this encounter with the stranger. And he's sitting in a cafe, he's drinking some coffee and there's a TV on behind him. He wasn't paying attention to it, but the reporter on the TV said something that immediately piqued his interest. The reporter was talking about a guy that was currently on death row that apparently had removed all of the inside car door handles inside of his car after his first would-be victim, a college student, had apparently escaped by opening a car door while he was moving. The student runs over to the TV and sees on the screen there is an image of the guy they're talking about, this guy on death row, and it's the same guy who gave him a ride two years earlier. His name was John Wayne Gacy, AKA the Killer Clown. He had killed over 30 men and boys in Chicago, and then after killing them in his clown room, he would stuff them into a secret crawl space in his basement. And although we can't be certain, it seems extremely likely that this med student was supposed to be the first victim of John Wayne Gacy, but he leapt out of the car, forcing John Wayne Gacy to change his strategy and make sure the next person was not able to do that. In the 1970s, a young woman and young man were on their very first date together, and it wasn't going very well. It wasn't going badly, it was just really, really awkward. They just were not meshing at all. And so as they're getting ready to leave and retire for the night, the guy is thinking to himself, I have nothing to lose here. We're probably not gonna go on a second date. And he says to the woman, hey, do you wanna not go home right now and actually come on a hike with me? And he goes, I know this sounds like a terrible idea, but hear me out. I go mountain climbing in this area called Provo Canyon. It's not that far from here. There are these beautiful trails that lead up the side of the canyon to these amazing scenic overlooks. And tonight it's a new moon, so there's great visibility. And I just think that you might enjoy it. And so at first the woman is obviously a little bit hesitant, but when he says, look, I go hiking there at night all the time. I love it out there. And I promise if there's any weirdness, if you don't like being there, we'll just turn around and leave. It's totally safe. And so after a little bit of coaxing, she finally says, okay, you know what? That sounds fun. Let's go do it. And so their date that had been really awkward suddenly became really exciting. And the two of them were kind of like thrilled, like, wow, look at us making our way up for a nighttime hike through Provo Canyon. And so they arrive at the, the mouth of this canyon and they're both obviously excited and they hop out and they start walking up this trail that brings them into a heavily forested section of the canyon. Now to this point, the guy felt like this was a really great idea. 
He really had gone hiking here a bunch, and he really did know the area well. But as the trail brought them into the forested area, the guy remembers feeling this overwhelming sense of dread. He didn't know why, it was just like an overwhelming sense of anxiety that something bad was going to happen to them. But he had worked so hard to convince his date to come with him, and had convinced her it was safe that he's not about to let on to her that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he put on, you know, his strong face and just kind of suppressed it and just kept on walking and, you know, holding her hand tight and they just continued their walk. But his sense of dread would just build and build to the point where he was really on edge. And what he didn't know, but would find out later is that his date, the woman, she also had this horrible sense of dread as soon as they went into the forest but she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to seem like a party pooper because he seemed really excited about it. At some point as they're walking down this path, the man steps on something that felt soft. He didn't know what it was, but it caused him to freeze immediately. And he's holding her hand. He kind of jerks her to get her to stop. And before he can even look down and see what he's standing on, he hears rustling coming from the bushes just off the trail. She hears it too. And both of them, without saying a word to each other, because again, you got to remember, they're both really stressed. They haven't let on to the other how stressed they are, but they're both basically ready to leave. And so the two of them turn around and they hightail it out of there. He has no idea what he stepped on. They don't know what they heard in the bushes bushes, but they don't care. The anxiety was so high, they just wanted to leave. Years later, that man and woman who had this very strange date would actually be married. And they'd be sitting down watching TV together and they're flipping through the channels and they land on an interview with a death row inmate. And the interviewer is asking the inmate, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red handed? And the guy being interviewed says, yes, one time. I was in the forest up in Provo Canyon one night and a young couple came walking up the trail. I didn't see him, so I only had a chance to jump into the bushes right next to the trail. And the guy actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. But for some reason, he didn't look down and see what he was standing on. And the two of them didn't notice me just a few feet away from them. They just turned around and walked away. Turns out that young couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy. Before Bundy was executed, he confessed to over 30 murders, but many people believe the true number of victims is much, much, much higher. So that's going to do it, guys. Let me know what you thought of these three